Welcome back to the Der Show. As you can probably see from my slanted roof, I'm back on Martha's Vineyard. And boy, <laughs> they let me know it with a bang. So uh, here I am on Martha's Vineyard and Chabad, this great organization that I helped found on, on the vineyard and at Harvard, a Jewish uh, pro-Israel organization, invited me to teach a course on the Bible. Um, I wrote a book about uh, the book of Genesis called The Genesis of Justice. So the rabbi at Chabad asked me to teach uh, a four-unit course on the book of, of Genesis. Um, people signed up. It was fine. Then the opposition started. Uh, people started threatening to quit uh, Chabad and to boycott and protest. Uh, the fact that this organization would give me a platform, me, somebody who actually defended Donald Trump and the Constitution of the United States in front of the Senate. How could any Martha's Vineyard organization allow me to teach a class? And so uh, protests began all over the island and letters were written and there's a website now and people are attacking me and people are, are scamming me and, and, and uh, uh, doing all kinds of things in order to protest my being on Martha's Vineyard. There were signs uh, last year, impeach Alan Dershowitz, throw him off the vineyard. This is the place of left-wing tolerance. No, this is the place of hard left uh, McCarthyism. But I'm going to teach the class and there will be protests. And I will continue to defend anybody whose constitutional rights are violated, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. And I will continue to oppose the get Trump. Uh, mentality that uh, that uh, exists, um, particularly on Martha's Vineyard and in places like uh, like Chilmark. Uh, the irony, of course, is Chilmark itself was subject to McCarthyism back in the 1950s because so many of its residents had been communists or socialists. And now their uh, spiritual descendants who live on the vineyard, the, the hard left, are engaging in their own form of McCarthyism. They will not tolerate the presence of a person who defended Donald Trump on the floor of the Senate against an unconstitutional impeachment. But I'm going to continue to to do it. All right. Obviously, uh, the news, uh, which I predicted, of course, uh, as you remember, is that uh, um, President Biden has decided not to run for re-election. I knew that was going to happen. He couldn't resist. This is probably the first case in history where a newspaper uh, decided who was going to be president. The New York Times um, really uh, was responsible, at least in substantial part, for the decision of, of Biden to step down and not to run. He couldn't tolerate the fact that virtually every journalist, every journalist associated with the Times, I don't think of any exceptions, called for his uh, stepping down and uh, said that uh, uh, he could not win and could not beat um, uh, Donald Trump. And so he couldn't resist it. And, you know, donors and others uh, decided to pull the plug and um, he went along with it. And um, not surprisingly, uh, he also endorsed uh, Kamala Harris to uh, replace him. So, look, I'm not a politician, so uh, you can have your own judgments. I haven't yet decided who to vote for. My vote may depend in part on who Kamala Harris picks to be vice president. Obviously, if she picks... Um, um, uh, Liz Warren, I can't vote for Liz Warren. She's a racist, sexist, DEI bigot. Uh, I know her. I've known her for 40 years and I wouldn't trust her uh, to govern anything. You know, she's a bankruptcy uh, lawyer. When she first decided to run, she called me in and said, Alan, I don't know anything about foreign policy. Maybe you can give me a tutorial in the Middle East. She didn't even know where Israel was. Um, and now she's one of the most virulently anti-Israel, anti-American, anti-Western um, uh, people in the Senate. She's a, a, a horrible disgrace to Harvard and to the Senate uh, and to America. And um, so if she's on the ticket, forget about it. I will campaign vigorously against any ticket that Liz Warren is on, because if she became the president of the United States, she would sell out this country. She would put this country into bankruptcy uh, to use her own um, uh uh, issue that she is uh, an expert on, the only issue she's an expert on. When I made my argument in front of the United States Senate, an argument that was as crystal clear as anything could be based on the Constitution, she gave a press conference saying she didn't understand anything I said. 
that's not my fault. That's her fault if she can't understand a simple, straightforward constitutional argument. So it, it all depends. Um, obviously, if, um, if uh, Kamala Harris were to pick a centrist, a moderate, um, like Manchin, I don't think she would pick him, or like Josh Shapiro, more likely, or others, uh, that would factor into my consideration. So um, people are telling me who to vote for. I'm going to make that decision. That's my constitutional right. My wife will make her decision. It may not be the same as mine. Uh, my children will make their decisions. I'm sure it will not be, in all cases, the same as mine. We'll, we'll wait and see. But uh, for this show, what I wanted to do is lend my own particular expertise to the to the headlines instead of getting involved in, in, in political considerations. I want to talk about the legal issues that grow out of the fact that really for the first time since Lyndon Johnson, a sitting president, uh, decided not to seek uh, re-election and has to be replaced. Lyndon Johnson did it early. I think it was in March of 1968. So there was time for the convention and primaries and others to decide who to nominate. It was Hubert Humphrey, who eventually lost to Richard Nixon. I campaigned hard for Hubert Humphrey, who I think would have been a great, a great president, but it was not to be. But this is not March. <laughs> this is uh, July, and um, we're only um, you know a few uh, weeks away from the Democratic convention, and only a few months away from the election. So. Legal issues opposed. Let, let me start with the most intriguing, but the most far-fetched legal issue. That's all over the internet. I must have gotten 25 emails, maybe more, uh, saying, well, you know what the Democrats are going to do? They're going to have a, a deadlock convention. Nobody's going to be able to decide. And so they're going to figure out a way of making Barack Obama president again. Uh, and various tactics have been uh, suggested. Well, get him to be Kamala Harris's vice president. And then when Kamala Harris wins the election, she steps down and automatically the vice president becomes the president. And, and that way it's permissible because uh, you remember the constitution, uh, 22nd amendment doesn't say that a person can't serve three terms Here's what it says. No person shall be elected, elected to the office of president more than twice. So what they're saying is he was elected to the office of president only twice. And then he became the president through the resignation of the president because he was the vice president. There were about 18 things wrong with that. But uh, let me let me go over the two of the most obvious. First of all, when the framers of the 22nd Amendment said no person shall be elected, they meant no person shall serve. Uh, they probably could have been a little bit more precise in their language, but obviously they meant he could serve. The other thing is he's not, Barack Obama's not eligible to run for vice president of the United States. That's because of the 12th Amendment. Um, you know, people should really read the Constitution when they talk about it. So here's what the 12th Amendment to the Constitution says. Um, <laughs> they, uh, let's see, um, essentially it says, it's a long, long amendment, that a person cannot run for vice president um, unless he is qualified to be the president. Oh, yeah. But no person constitutionally ineligible to the office of president shall be eligible to that of vice president of the United States. So since Barama would not be eligible, and here we have a new term in addition to um, um, the 22nd Amendment shall be elected, we have eligible. So Barack Obama wouldn't be eligible to be vice president because he's not eligible to be uh, a president. So I think the argument is, is totally uh, a made-up argument. I don't know which side benefits from, from the argument, but um, take it from me. Uh, here, here's my guarantee. There is zero chance that Barack Obama can ever be president of the United States again. Now his wife can be president, and I think his wife, you know, a lot of people say she doesn't want to be president. I don't believe that for a minute. 
if she thought she could be nominated and elected, I think she would want to be the president of the United States. I don't think she could be um, nominated or she could be nominated probably, but I don't think she would win. I think she would lose. Um, and in any event, uh, she's not going to run against Kamala Harris. So um, I think what we're going to see is Kamala Harris um, get the nomination. Um, and the reason some of it is legal. Number one, there's a large pocket of money that has been donated already to the um, Biden-Harris um, um, campaign. Let, let's be very clear about that. Mm -hmm. This is money that goes directly to the campaign, which means that it has limits to the amount any donor can give. It's, these are not PAC. This is not PAC money. I have to be very clear about this. This is a hard technical legal argument, but it's very important. So the money that's now in the uh, Biden-Harris campaign is small donation money, which can be used for the campaign itself. It can be used to pay staffers. It can be used to pay travel. It can be used to pay for uh, ads. The enormous amount of money that has been donated to pro-Biden-Harris PACs, those have unlimited funds. Um, you can give a billion dollars. Um, um, and people have given $100 million to the PACs. The problem is the PACs can't contribute to the campaigns directly. They can do virtually everything else. But technically, they can't pay for staff members. They can't pay for travel. They can't pay for rent. They can't pay for, uh, for ads that come from the campaign itself. They can have their own uh, ads. And so there's this big pot of money that's already been raised for the campaign. No one else can get that other than Harris. The reason Harris can get it legally, and there will be some challenges to it, but I think those challenges won't, won't um, survive, um, is because the campaign is the Biden-Harris campaign. So if Biden's not in it, Harris gets it. But it's not the Biden-Harris, then name a third person, campaign. If a third person decides to run, and it's not even clear, there is going to be a third person that was talking about Manchin coming back to the Democratic Party. By the way, you wouldn't have to do that. You can get the nomination to be the Democratic candidate for president without being a Democrat. Um, you can be an independent and get the nomination. Um, when uh, there was talk about uh, Joe Lieberman getting the Republican nomination for vice president under McCain, he was an independent. And I don't think he would have turned to become a Republican. You don't have to be. But Manchin has now said he's not going to he's not going to run. I just don't see anybody else bucking the machine and saying, all right, I'm now going to run. After all, President Clinton, uh, Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, they have already endorsed um, uh, already endorsed Kamala Harris. Uh, Biden is not yet. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Biden has. Uh, Obama has not yet endorsed her. And some people are saying, oh, that's because he wants his wife to be president. No, I don't think so. I think he's generally taken the position from the beginning that as a former president, something that Clinton is too. He's not going to nominate anybody in the nominating process. He's going to support whoever the candidate is. But you'd think that he could follow Clinton, but he hasn't done that. But in light of the fact that so many people have already endorsed uh, uh, Kamala Harris, I just don't think that there's going to be any opposition. So here are the legal questions. So the first legal question is Obama can't run. Uh, can't be the president, can't be the vice president. That's off the table. So whatever you want to read in the internet, just forget about that. Throw that in the garbage pail. The second is the fact that um, uh, Harris gets the money. Um, that's true. And there'll be challenges perhaps, but those challenges will not, will not survive. And so the third question now is, is it too late for Kamala Harris's name to be put uh, the, as president um, in, in various states? And the answer to that is no. Um, even if there were state restrictions, and there may be some, there's something in Ohio and a few other places, the Republican Party can change it. They're not bound by the law to stick to what was their previous um, uh, policies. They're not the government. They are a political party, and they have tremendous flexibility in deciding what the rules are. And 
there might be some states that have rules that say you have to be on the ballot uh, so and so weeks or months in advance. But they too, even though they're government, they too can change. So I think we can be absolutely assured that Kamala Harris will be on the ballot in, in every state. Oh, just one, one other point. And one of the people who's being considered for vice president, obviously there are a lot of people who are considered, but one is Gavin Newsom. And uh, people are saying, oh, no, 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 he can't be on the ballot because he comes from the same state as, as Kamala Harris. And I don't think either of them can really change states at this point. She is, after all, the vice president. He is, after all, the governor. He certainly can't change states. But it's not an absolute barrier to running um, um, under the 12th Amendment. Uh, he can run. Uh, if he gets nominated, he can run. And then the electors would have to meet. And uh, if California wins, as it would win, and it has a tremendous number of electoral votes, uh, second highest number of electoral votes, um, or the highest number, highest number, uh, Texas and California are close, but I think it's California that has the most electoral votes. Um, all those electoral votes could not go both to Harris and to, to Newsom. Um, and then if that made the difference, um, you'd still have a president, but <laughs> the vice presidential race would then be thrown to the House of Representatives. And the question is, which House of Representatives? Is it the House of Representatives that exists now, um, which is um, uh, controlled by um, uh, the Republicans? Or is it the House of Representatives that would be elected uh, on Election Day um, uh, and takes office on January 1st? It's, it's a very interesting question because the electoral votes are cast in December, but not really validated until January. So you have a hiatus here and, 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 um, and it's possible you'd have a Republican house, um, unlikely, but it's possible you'd have a Republican house. In any event, it is theoretically possible that Gavin Newsom could be nominated to be vice president, but practically very unlikely. The Republicans had greater flexibility for that when they were thinking about uh, Rubio being nominated, comes from the same state, as, as, as Trump. Of course, Trump could always change his residency by, you know, obviously um, Rubio couldn't. But even so, uh, if the House were then controlled by Republicans, and if the vice presidency were to be thrown into the House, it would be no harm, no foul. They would just elect uh, Rubio. But with the Democrats, it's different. So Gavin Newsom, although theoretically eligible to run for vice president is not going to get the nomination. So the nomination is likely to go to a, a, a governor um, and it's likely to go to a male governor. I mean, it would be so interesting and it would really get a lot of people very energized if it was an all woman ticket. If Kamala Harris, um, you know, were to nominate one of the governors uh, who's on the list who are, or a woman or a senator who's a woman. Um, so that's a political issue. There's no legal issue attached to that. So law plays too great a role, in my view, in presidential elections. I mean, we're seeing these absurd criminal charges being thrown at Donald Trump. Uh, my book, Get Trump, makes that point, I think, quite strongly. Um, none of those cases are, are particularly strong. The only one that has any validity at all is the Florida case involving the documents, and that's that's a misdemeanor, essentially. I mean, it, maybe it's called a felony, but it's a it's the kind of thing every president does. They all take home with them some classified material, and I'm sure they all show it to friends or tell it to friends. So uh, even if he were to be convicted of that, it wouldn't be a big deal. The only thing he's been convicted of is the non-crime in New York. But uh, law plays too much of a role, uh, in my view, in, in, in politics. And uh, But uh, my message for you today is that the law is not going to play a major role in who gets selected to be um, either the presidential or vice presidential candidates of the Democratic Party. So uh, feel free uh, to vote your conscience. Uh, the law is not going to stop you from voting who you want to vote for. Uh, let your views be known. Lobby, uh, write, um, speak out. Um, we know who the Republican nominees are, are going to be. 
Uh, we don't know who the Democratic nominees are going to be, but my prediction, and I'll make a prediction so far, I'm 100%, uh, is that uh, Kamala Harris will be the nominee of the Democratic Party and that um, either she will pick, if she was smart, you know what she would do? She would throw open the vice presidential nomination to an open convention and have debates and discussion that would attract a lot of attention to the convention. I don't think she's going to do that. I think she's going to make a decision once it's clear that she has the nomination in hand, she's going to make the decision as to who she picks and that will have uh, an impact on who independents and people like me uh, 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 vote for. Um, the selection of Vance um, by, um, by um, Trump clearly has had an impact on people. It's um, taken moderates and said, well, you know, we thought maybe he'd pick somebody more to the center. Uh, more moderate, uh, but he's picked somebody who is probably to the right of him, certainly on foreign policy, uh, to the right of him. So we'll have that <laughs> impact our our election. So, okay. Um, let's uh, turn now to some questions. Most of the questions um, I received before the statement was made by President Biden that he's getting out of the election, but there were some that came afterwards. So here they are. You just can't pick a good candidate for president. This is directed to me. Obama twice. Well, the second time I regretted the vote. Uh, Hillary Clinton. I still support Hillary Clinton. Uh, Biden. I think that was the right vote for me. Carter. I didn't. I, I voted for Carter, but I campaigned against him for the nomination. Uh, McGovern. I did support uh, McGovern. And Dukakis. I did support Dukakis. Be an American and forget about being such a hypnotized Democrat of the early 1960s. And Johnson was a racist, couldn't stand African-Americans. You're embarrassing yourself. Lyndon Johnson did more for African-Americans probably than any president in history. He, under his uh, presidency, more civil rights acts were passed than under any other president. And so uh, I, I absolutely deny your uh, characterization of Lyndon Johnson. He was a deeply, deeply flawed man. Uh, so was John Kennedy, a deeply, deeply flawed man. Uh, there are very few presidents who are not. Flawed in some way, but uh, those two were very deeply flawed. But uh, but uh, Lyndon Johnson was not a racist. Okay, Professor, I admire your call for the Democrats to have families of Hamas hostages speak out at the convention. However, because of the influence of the radical left wing of the party, the chances that this will happen are slim. Certainly, Biden would never call for it. The question is, will Harris call for it? It's a very tough decision for Democrats. Remember what happened at the convention um, uh, uh, four years ago. Uh, any mention of Israel was responded to by boos. And um, it's gotten worse, obviously. And so if the Democrats were to try to have hostage families, even the families of American hostages, I think it would be treated with uh, boos and walkouts. So I don't know whether the Democrats are going to chance that. Um, a number of the letters have talked about that. Right now, Jewish people are speaking about the hostage situation. This is this is letter comes while the convention, the Republican convention, was going on, and people are chanting, "Bring them home! Bring them home!" At the RNC, I really doubt that's going to happen at the Islamic Democratic Convention. I think that overstates it a little bit, but we'll wait and see. I issued a challenge. Uh, we've talked about it. Um, I'm I have an open mind. Let's see what happens. Um, I will never forget the 2012 Democratic National Convention when hundreds of Democrats started booing Jews and booing at Israel being even mentioned. It was sickening. I'm smart enough to realize who hates the Jews, and it was evident since then and is even more evident now. It's, it's a very serious issue. It's a very serious problem, not only in the United States. It's a problem in France, a problem in England, it's a problem in Spain, it's a problem in Canada now and Australia. So we're seeing pervasive anti anti-Semitism uh, throughout the world, and um, the Republicans have stood up against it. Let's see what the Democrats do. Um, uh, professor, Joe Biden says he has been working with constitutional scholars on ways to reform the Supreme Court. If one of those scholars is Lawrence Tribe, and it is, we know that, because Tribe told the Times that he's been consulting with um, uh, Biden, and he will be consulting with, uh, with Harris, 
if one of those scholars is Lawrence Tribe, what are the chances that these proposed changes would be constitutional? Well, uh, pretty slim. I mean, um, first of all, you can't have um, uh, time restrictions on or age restrictions on who can be a Supreme Court justice because the Constitution provides that justices shall serve during good behavior for life, essentially. But uh, Tribe wants to have term limits. He wants to, I think he wants term limits. I know he wants, um, uh, a, uh, I know he wants term limits. Does he also want upper age limits? That's that's the question. I, it's ironic if, if Biden would want upper age limits of 75, but he himself couldn't be qualified under that. All right, you are a legal genius, but a political novice. Delusionally, if you think your party is going to support Israel, they hate you. Why does that not penetrate your skull? There are a lot of people in the Democratic Party who hate me, obviously. Uh, people who live on Martha's Vineyard hate me, and they hate me because um, I'm not a, a down-the-line Democrat who supports everything the Democrats do. I do support Israel, and I do support Donald Trump's constitutional rights. So, again... Hard question for me. It's an easy question uh, for political conservatives who support Israel. Um, that's easy, but it's a hard, hard question um, for uh, political liberals like me. Remember, I'm not a leftist. I'm a liberal. There's a big difference between being a person of the left and being liberal. I'm a liberal. I'm very much like classic conservatives, support free speech, due process, a variety of freedoms and liberty. So... Um, but it's hard. It's hard because I believe in a woman's right, for the most part, to choose. I believe in gay rights. I believe in a range of issues that the Republican platform uh, takes uh, a somewhat more negative view on. Okay. <sighs> Professor, uh, if Joe Biden drops out and Harris is not the nominee, then whoever is choosing will not be able to use the substantial money donated to the Biden-Harris ticket. Talked about that. That's probably correct. Again, it'll be litigated, but that's probably correct. Professor, if the major power brokers in the Democratic Party are afraid to offend the far left by having hostage families speak at the convention, then they certainly will fear their wrath for passing over Harris, who is both a woman and a person of color in the event that Biden does drop out. Well, he has dropped out, and so we'll see what the power brokers uh, do. I think you're absolutely right, and that's why I think so many people immediately jumped on the Harris bandwagon. Many of them in private are not happy. That was their choice, but they have no option. Uh, they cannot uh, pass over uh, a woman who is black. I mean, is that DEI politics? It certainly sounds like DEI politics. Um, and I think the country is moving away from DEI politics. And whether that hurts the Democratic Party in the election, I don't know. I mean, obviously, the Republicans will paint Harris as a DEI candidate. Um, you know, there was a, an op-ed, most ridiculous op-ed, among the most ridiculous op-eds in the New York Times, an op-ed saying, yesterday on Sunday, saying that if Harris is a DEI person, then surely Vance is too. What an absurd comparison. Vance, summa cum laude at Ohio State University. Yale Law School, Yale Law Journal, best-selling uh, author, person who fought in the Marines. Uh, why does that make him a DEI candidate? Just because he comes from a hillbilly background. Uh, he overcame that background and proved his merit. He is a meritocracy uh, candidate. He didn't get uh, summa cum laude because he was a hillbilly, he got summa cum laude despite being a hillbilly and having a mother who was a, a drug addict. The, it was one of the dumbest op-eds I've ever seen, but the Times has a policy. It will publish really, really, really dumb op-eds. In, in fact, this op-ed said, well, I have no idea what, what, what uh, uh, Vance's grades are. Well, just look it up. It's public. He was summa cum laude. You know what summa cum laude means? It's the highest, highest. I didn't get summa cum laude. I'm magna cum laude from Brooklyn College and Yale Law School. All right, Yale Law School doesn't have summa cum laude. I did graduate first in my class. Um, but but summa cum laude. My granddaughter graduated summa cum laude from, from Harvard. Very, very few people. There's a special section for summa graduates. I think there were like seven or eight of them in the whole Harvard class. 
He graduated summa cum laude. That does not sound like a DEI uh, a, a candidate. Uh, you can have very critical things to say about Vance, but the one thing you can't say about him is that he's not a meritocratic appointment. You can say that, whether it's true or not, it's certainly a plausible argument that you can make that argument about uh, Harris. She flunked the bar. Uh, she did not have a distinguished uh, career. Um, uh, and um, her race and gender did play a role in her selection. Um, whereas in Vance's case, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's just, but the Times will publish anything, any drivel, uh, without any editorial standards, if it can, if it supports their conclusion. So we live in interesting times. Um, I didn't uh, imagine ten years ago that we would be living through an age like this of rampant anti-Semitism, rampant hatred for America, for Israel, for democracies. Um, uh, so many issues that uh, affect us at a time when the world isn't suffering greatly. You know, this is not the 1920s, uh, 1930s, when there were depressions all over the world and inflation and horrible economic situations that it explains, it doesn't justify, but explains the rise of communism, the rise of Nazism, the rise of extremism. There are no such justifications today. We're not living in, in a world, uh, I mean, yeah, we had COVID, but we got over it. Uh, we're not living in a world of economic uh, turmoil. People are doing okay. Uh, and it's not the people who aren't doing okay that are the extremists. It's the people that are doing okay are the extremists. So strange, strange times we live in, and uh, I'm here to report on them. So I'll see you all tomorrow. Was that about a half an hour? I didn't have a watch. Hang on.